All right, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Thomas Bartholo, who um, has been a graduate student in my group at UC San Diego uh, for the past five years or so. In fact, he just defended his thesis on Tuesday. So congratulations, Thomas, for that. Um, Thomas uh, really has pioneered an approach in my group uh, using structural biology and integrating it with uh, computational chemistry, uh, and in particular using uh, protein NMR to understand protein-protein interactions and carrier protein-dependent biosynthesis. Thomas, take it away. Oh, I should finalize this. He just accepted a postdoctoral position at uh, UCSF with Jim Wells. And so uh, he'll stick around for another month or so, and then we will wish him well. Thomas, take it away. Thank you, Mike. I've been working a lot in uh, both protein NMR and computation. So um, I'll try to get through a lot of um, pretty complicated techniques pretty quickly. So uh, we work in fatty acid biosynthesis. Um, I like to think of this as a cellular assembly line, where if you think about like a car in an assembly line, there's a conveyor belt that will carry the growing um, vehicle. Uh, between different stations where some sort of, uh, you know, work will happen. In the same way, in fatty acid biosynthesis, there's an ACP, which is um, floating independently and will move between different enzymes to, to perform catalysis. So our work has been um, entirely in type 2 FAS. So these are free-floating enzymes that are, um, you know, moving about however they wish in the systole. So we've been really trying to look into how there might be a, a mechanism for both efficiency and specificity gained through protein-protein interactions. Now this, uh, the process moves through, uh, here we go, the um, first association of an acyl carrier protein with the ketosynthase. This um, catalyzes a Claisen condensation, elongating the product by two carbons but leaving two um, keto groups. This can go to a keto reductase to be reduced to a alcohol at the three position, a dehydratase to be dehydrated to a um, unsaturated fat, and finally an enoyl reductase to be fully saturated. So this is sort of the cycle that nature moves through as it wants to create longer and longer carbon chains. Um, now, at least in the work we've been looking at, there's two mechanisms to really unload these fatty acids. Um, there's thioesterases, which can cleave off the fat to leave you with a uh, free fatty acid and a whole OACP. Um, and then today I'm going to be talking about um, one of the natural product pathways, lip B biosynthesis, which um, has a really interesting, very specific mechanism to grab a C8 fatty acid for um, the biosynthesis of lipoic acid. No, that's not, I can go to a laser pointer. So, um, like I was saying, uh, in terms of, you know, practical interest in these pathways, um, if you think about biofuels or a lot of different industrial applications, if you had a mechanism to specifically cleave fatty acids that you desired, um, that could be very useful in a lot of different ways. Um, in terms of natural products or virulence factors, FAS is involved in the um, creation of a lot of different natural products. Um, there are acyl-homocerine lactones. These are the most common um, form of quorum sensing molecules. So bacteria will create these to sort of signal to one another to coordinate, um, to coordinate uh, attacking our, our bodies. So if we had a way to understand these more and knock them out, maybe it'd be very valuable. Um, secondarily, lipoic acid is a essential cofactor. So the more we can learn about how bacteria make it, the more we might be able to find an avenue to inhibit it. Now, um, a little bit of details about ACP. It is a very small protein. It's only 77 amino acids in E. coli, um, about nine kilodaltons. Uh, structurally, it's a four helical bundle where at the center of these helices, there's a very uh, hydrophobic pocket that the ACP sits inside of. Um, excuse me. So in yellow here is the fatty acid, and then in the kind of gray colored by atom is the phosphopantothene cofactor. So this is sort of like a leash that ACP can use to hold on to the fatty acid. 
um, when it flips into the um, active site of other enzymes. So um, today I'm going to be talking about HSQC NMR um, pretty, pretty briefly. Um, so uh, we don't need to go through too much, but at its basic, um, the HSQC spectra is like the, um, the fingerprint or a really good picture of all of the um, residues on a protein. So this spectra lets us see each of the backbone amides and whatever is happening to change their chemical environment. So whether that's um, an additive you wanna add into your NMR tube or adding in a partner protein, anything that affects the ACP, we'll be able to see on the spectra. So um, sort of the first lead into this experiment was a recently published um, uh, study I did with Tara Stein in the lab. So uh, we wanted to look at if there was a control mechanism for chain flipping in lipoic acid. So we know that um, lipoic acid needs a C8 acyl chain. So we were wondering if we could see it um, filtering out, say, a C12. So to design this experiment, we first looked at our model of chain flipping, where the ACP can first bind onto a partner protein, in this case, uh, the gray blob would be lip B. And then if it finds the correct substrate, it can flip its um, fatty acid in to perform the catalysis. Now we hypothesize there's a control mechanism for this because uh, you really don't want to see 12 lip B because that wouldn't be active in the enzyme. Now, um, to look at this, we put a C13 um, uh, fatty acid onto the ACP. So this gives us one tiny little reporter on the chemical environment of that um, carbon. So on this spectra, the uh, carbon chemical shift is on the Y and uh, the proton chemical shift is on the X. So on both C8 and C12 ACPP sitting happily in solution with nothing um, bothering it, the fatty acid is sitting comfortably in that hydrophobic pocket I spoke about before and their chemical environment looks very similar. Now, if we add in lipoic or lip B, um, so the enzyme which should be specific for C8, we, as we would expect, see a change in the spectra for the C8 ACP, where this um, peak showing our carbon has moved pretty far down the spectra, probably suggesting it's sitting in the active site. Uh, similarly, there's some little side peaks, maybe coming from you know some small states it has to take as it flips from ACP to partner. Um, really interestingly, if we look at C12, um, it looks the exact same way it did while it was in solution. Um, so what we think this is telling us is that by some means, um, the, the structure of the ACP, or at least its protein-protein interactions, are such that um, lip B is not performing this like pretty large dynamic shift to move the substrate. So to study that on the protein-protein interaction level, um, we did what's called a NMR titration. So um, we create uh, five different solutions. Uh, the first being the zero point. So this is just our acyl carrier protein sitting alone in a tube. Then we add increasing molar equivalents of a partner protein. And um, we look to see how that affects the chemical environment or the um, the electronic environment of every single residue on our partner, our ACP. So um, kind of simplified on the left here, this is the zero point spectra of um, one of these residues. And then in green, yellow, orange, and red, we can see the, uh, the movement of that peak as the um, environment changes um, as you get more and more of your partner protein. So um, this is really, really valuable because it can give us a look at which residues are moving and how they're affected. Um, but even just as powerfully as these residues that move a lot, um, we can also see where there's not really any change happening. So um, for every valine 40 that moves really far, there are other residues that don't really get affected by this um, partner protein binding, and that's just as valuable. Now, the value I'll show today to simplify things is a chemical shift perturbation, a CSP. So this is basically just a way to add together the shift in the proton dimension and the shift in the nitrogen dimension. Um, this alpha value is um, just a scaling factor. 
it basically just accounts for the fact that um, uh, nitrogen chemical shifts are so much larger than proton ones. So if you just added them together normally, um, the only value you would see would be from the nitrogen shift. So it's just kind of evening the playing field. Okay, so add a little bit more detail. Um, Lippy is very cool because while the uh, FAS machinery is running and fatty acids are going from four to 18 carbons and they have all of these different substitutions, uh, LIPB needs to float in and grab a C8 ACP um, to perform its function. Um, that can be loaded onto say an E2 domain and then there's um, other enzymes, LIPA, which can um, add the sulfurs. Now, um, to study the protein-protein interactions and see if there's some sort of mechanism controlling this. Uh, we created three ACP um, mimetics. That's a C6, C8, and C10 ACP. So um, really briefly, these were created by the um, sort of the one-pot method that we've developed in the Burkhart lab. This is a chemoenzymatic loading where you basically create a phosphopantothene analog um, that you can load by the native cellular machinery. Um, now, the only difference between our probe and the native fatty acid is instead of a sulfur um, forming a thioester right there, we have an amide group just to give it more stability and to prevent hydrolysis. Now, these are the actual CSP results from the experiment. Um, on the x-axis, these are the residues on the ACP. So going from three to 75 that we can see. And on the y-axis, these are the CSPs. So a larger value means a larger shift on the spectra, means there's more of an effect when the partner protein is binding. Now going in increased chain length, C6 ACP um, is in green. And basically, we saw very little movement on the spectra. Um, we've worked with like 15 or so proteins doing these titrations. And um, based on what we know, this looks like a non-functional interaction. There's no large perturbations on the interface. So these um, plots I'll show go from zero being white to uh, the most green being um, a large CSP. Now C8 is the native substrate. And um, similar to what you would expect of a native substrate of an enzyme, we see very large shifts. This tells us that there's a very stable, very strong protein interface occurring, and that um, this is probably critical for the catalysis and for that chain flipping. Uh, lastly, C10 has slightly larger effects of binding, but not nearly as large as uh, C10. So on the interface, um, C8 has all of these dark regions, which are really strong um, salt bridge interactions that are forming. Okay. Um, so yeah, just briefly before I move on, it is very interesting to see that between two carbons, we have all of these differences in the strength of their interactions in solution. To answer why this was happening, we looked to the protein interfaces. So the ACP is highly electronegative. Um, so we would expect uh, almost for it to be a pretty simple interaction since LIPB is very positive. Um, one thing we did notice about LIPB's surface is that there's a very deep channel right here where the active site is located in that pocket right there. So for the ACP to bind and form a complex and have that chain flipping event, it would need to be nestled pretty deep into this um, channel that you'll see a little bit uh, more later. So um, to explore how this might be happening, we turned to the computational protocols um, I've been developing and published last year. Um, really briefly, we're working with ICM Molesoft, um, which is developed by Ruben Abagian at UCSD. Um, by using previously published cross-linked structures from the lab, we benchmarked um, this software and developed a protocol that would give us very accurate replication of the interfaces. Um, this involved preparing the uh, proteins correctly. We leverage our CSPs. So we look at the um, chemical shifts where we have large um, salt bridges predicted and we feed those into the protein or into the program. And then this gives us an ensemble of docking orientations that we can look at the most stable. Um, 
And we found that with um, informed or supplied residues, we can really accurately recreate the interfaces and the global complex. So uh, structurally, um, the main differences between the chain lengths always occur at helix three in ACP. So in um, green, we have C6 ACPP, and in red, we have C10. And you can probably see that the orientation of that helix is mostly just sort of a slightly different angle up or down, um, but ultimately in a pretty similar place. It's about like an angstrom and a half RMSD. Um, on the other hand, the C8 ACP is pointing further out and kind of angled away from um, helix two. Um, it's about like two and a half angstroms out and um, creates kind of a larger space between helix two and helix three. Um, uh, you may see where I'm going with this. Um, so the lowest energy states are shown here for C6, C8, and C10. Um, one thing that was quickly noted is that C6 and C10 are not in an orientation where they're close enough to um, chain flip the fossil pantothene into the active site of lip B. Um, and it's worth saying that in terms of stability, C6 was the least stable. C10 was um, like a semi-okay complex, while C8 was a very, very strong um, interface, kind of matching the strengths of the CSPs that we saw. Now, structurally, um, this uh, interface is very, very like deeply um, bound in. So helix two is nestled pretty far into um, that groove that I spoke about before. Um, the phosphopantothene um, carrying residue serine 36 is shown as this orange dot, and it's very close to the orange colored active site. Um, Likewise, helix three is kind of sitting off to the side, comfortably or, um, forming a salt bridge with a lysine right there. Um, now, our next question was, if this is such a strong interface, why won't C6 or C10 adopt this um, orientation? And what we saw was that um, the helix three angle I alluded to before was such that um, there was a steric occlusion. So, uh, the D56 that's uh, forming a nice salt bridge in C8 is pointed directly into the backbone of lip B and the other chain lengths, um, basically making this an impossible orientation for uh, C6 or C10 to adopt. Um, so lastly, uh, ACP always has a pretty intricate set of um, salt bridges. As I said before, it's highly um, electronegative and binds electropositive residues. And um, matching that, we see this pretty, um, pretty nice network of uh, different interactions on the interface. Um, and uh, to kind of check that we were predicting um, what we saw in solution well, we mapped the chemical shift perturbations onto the docked orientation. And what we saw was that along the interface, we had kind of, um, very large perturbations at our predicted salt bridges, which was very reassuring because we know that there should be a large um, effect when the residues are interacting. Um, and just as importantly, um, residues such as a couple of um, glutamates down here, which would normally be interacting but have no predicted salt bridges in our docked model, have low chemical shift perturbations. So it looks like we have a good prediction of this interface and um, we're pretty confident with our, with our models. So um, summary, uh, the chemical shift perturbations demonstrate a clear preference for a C8 acyl, ch acyl chain bearing ACP. Uh, C8 ACPP has a stronger docked interface and the structure of LIPI appears to be structural, or architecturally uh, restricting the interactions of other chain lengths. Um, this follows um, previous literature is saying that helix three is the most structurally different between ACPs that have different substrates. Um, so it appears to kind of follow with um, what we've seen in literature. And um, we think this makes for a very, very cool um, uh, sort of um, filtering mechanism for the enzymes to uh, really rapidly achieve a specificity for a certain substrate. So um, thank you for listening. 
uh, I think I kept to 15 minutes and um, specifically um, Andrew, Anya um, and uh, the entire meeting for inviting us. And um, I should thank the Appella Lab and Shimei Wong, Ruben Abagayan and Mike and the whole lab. Thank you, I'll take some uh, questions. Oh, yeah. yes, thank you to Mike Donner uh, for, for, for sharing your science, uh, uh, science with us um, and, and showing how, how this uh, ACP protein can be a wonderful model to study um, protein substrate interactions and protein protein interactions. Uh, so, the question about the NMR technique so, obviously, that um, with ACP is possible or to do those kind of studies because it's quite small. What's the size limit for the protein that you would see um, to, to use your technique and to kind of make it more general? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so in terms of the maximum size limit for detection, um, you know, um, 20 to 30 kilodaltons would be like the nice cut off where it's gonna be a pretty easy study. Um, I think in theory, you could go up to 60. Um, if you're studying like um, complex formation and you can get a, um, if you can get a spectra of like a smaller unit that forms a complex. So ACP, for example, um, our titrations went up to um, 100 and like five kilodaltons when it formed a complex with partners. Um, but that, that's really pushing the sensitivity uh, limit. But, you know, people are always developing new, um, new methods and solid states becoming really good. So um, the field's kind of pushing out of that limit. Thank you. So we have uh, Don Hilbert uh, raising his hand. So Don, uh, you can now speak and ask your question yourself if you want to. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Thomas, yeah. for the nice presentation and congratulations on successfully defending your thesis. Thank I had two related questions. You indicated at several points that the interaction between the acylated ACP and the target protein was tight. Um, can you quantify that in thermodynamic and kinetic terms? What is the KD and how rapid is the dissociation of the complex? That's a really good question. So. Um... In terms of KD, yeah, we do we do predict it with a program called Titan. Um, so in terms of it was twenty three um, millimolar. So actually not like a super tight in terms of classical. Um, yeah, protein absolutely interaction. not. Okay, and so yeah. kinetically, it must also be very rapid. Yeah, and we know it is from so. Um, the, I, I didn't have time to get into this, but there's a concept called fast and slow exchange. So when we do the titration, we see our peak kind of moving in line. Mm -hmm. And this tells us that it's associating, dissociating faster than the experiment is occurring. Whereas if it's a very, very tight, very slow to dissociate complex, you'll get like two peaks that emerge separately. Sure, sure. So, My second question was, yeah. given, given this, in the normal elongation cycle, how does the ACP, the acylated ACP, choose the appropriate partner? Is it completely stochastic, stochastic or is there an ordered mechanism as you move through the elongation, reduction, elimination, um, reduction cycle? So that's a really good question. Um, a lot of my time in the lab has been trying to say it looks like there is um, similar mechanisms to what I saw in lib B. I don't think they are cut and dry what would achieve any, um, I think there's a lot of stochasticity still happening, mm -hmm. but I do think, um, and we've seen when there's a particular substrate um, uh, or a more specific substrate, they have these um, differences in strength of protein-protein interaction. Um, in terms of the like general like enol reductase, um, yeah, there probably is a lot of stochasticity in that interaction. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, so I have additional question following up on on Don's thought. So, so as the ACP moves from protein to protein, you mentioned also the limited stability of thioester. So is there thioester 
the business end, is it, is it shielded from water molecules as it travels from from one protein to the other? Um, and is, is there any information or is anything known about how that happens? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I had to go over it pretty briefly, but the um, fatty acids are actually pretty tightly held within the ACP during the whole um, the whole uh, elongation cycle. So um, that's part of why we think this um, specificity is being achieved because the proteins have to bind, form a strong complex, and then the um, acyl chain has to take like a pretty large, like 30 angstrom uh, path to leave the ACP and kind of like snake out of the center of the protein. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, the use of the amide is, um, you know, the thioester is stable on like the day scale, which is certainly much faster than elongation happens in the ACP. It's just, um, not really stable enough for like humans doing experiment time scales. <laughs> but it, it's very stable on the cellular time scale.